Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Gracie. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar about preparing your business for the General Data Protection Regulation. Hopefully, you'll see um, a title slide um, on screen um, now. Um, I'm recording the session, so um, I plan on sharing uh, uh, the slide pack and also um, a, a link to the recording of the session, um, so you can uh, revisit that or, or um, view that at any any time that you want to. Um, if you've got any questions, we'll take questions at the end. There's a questions panel uh, or question section within your uh, GoToWebinar panel, which you can use to uh, write questions as you go along, um, and we'll pick those at the end. I'm, I'm expecting to talk for roughly around an hour and then uh, allow plenty of time for questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, use that question panel and uh, we'll pick those up um, at the end of the session. So. Um, as I said, my name is Mark Gracie. I, I run a, a consultancy called Flavify Digital. Um, I'm a, a data compliance consultant um, and uh, super busy um, for obvious reasons around general data protection regulation at the moment. But uh, I also specialize in privacy and marketing compliance and web and data security. Um, my background is uh, very much in a, a regulatory field. I um, became a data protection manager when the 1998 Act in the UK became um, law. And um, from then on, for about 16 or so years, I was involved in internet and telecoms regulation, both internal compliance uh, as well as external stakeholder influencing. So I've been involved in discussions around uh, internet um, uh, liability and, and legal and regulatory things relating to the internet and telecoms and also uh, data protection and uh, data retention and, and data compliance in, in that field as well. And that's very much um, the foundation for um, why I'm doing the work I'm doing um, right now as well. So the, um, the idea of the session is that um, we will be covering um, GDPR in a, a overall sense. So uh, hopefully you'll get a, a grip on what is uh, GDPR and um, 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 sorry, I'm just reading some questions that have just come through while I'm, I'm looking. Um, so, uh, somebody saying they're muted and can't hear. Um, I'm just going to reply to that because obviously if I reply and they can't hear, they won't better hear me replying. Um, yes, you'll, um, so people, if they're worried about being, um, ah, okay, thank you. Welcome back, Linda. Um, and uh, Jennifer, you are asking, is there any chance we can have a copy of the slides? Um, yes, we're, well, I'll, I'll distribute a copy of the slides in the recording of the presentation at the, um, at the end. Um, so apologies for the brief interruption there, just making sure things uh, were working okay. Um, so we're gonna cover GDPR, and I'll have a quick um, overview of data protection in, in general, um, talk about the changes that GDPR is introducing, and then hopefully you'll have a view about whether it's something you need to worry about, and if so, um, I'll talk about some things about what compliance looks like and how you can, um, uh, the kind of things you might want to look at in terms of carrying out an audit and getting yourself GDPR ready um, by the 25th of May. So let's let's start with um, just uh, setting the, um, the scene with um, a quick overview of data protection. Um, the GDPR is obviously a data protection regulation, but um, its foundations are based on the uh, Data Protection Directive from Europe, which in the UK became the Data Protection Act 1998. Um, so um, I just wanted to cover off some of the basics so that we all understand some of the common principles and, and are at the same uh, the point in understanding before I start talking about the GDPR. So there's lots of definitions. GDPR's got, uh, I think, over 40 of them. Um, and, and in fact, are missing some that they could really do with. But uh, um, there's probably five key definitions when we talk about data protection that's important to understand. So data protection is all about personal data. That's data that helps you identify a living individual, either directly or indirectly. And what that means is if you have a pot of data which by itself doesn't look like um, personal data, but it has some way that you can connect it to some other data that does, then both sets of data would be personal data. The kind of things that you need to think about are, are um, uh, it's, it's a bit wider than just consumers. Um, so it's personal data that it identifies anybody. So it's going to be your clients, it's going to be your employees' data, it's going to be um, even the business contacts you have. So if you identify an employee within a business, then that's um, identifying um, that data 
and identifying that person, therefore that data is personal data and therefore data protection applies. So if you identify any individual, personal data applies, whether it's in a B2B or a B2C um, context. Now in terms of processing, that's what you're doing with the data and it's more much wider than just um, the use of the data and, and what you might be um, collecting it for. Um, it covers everything. Um, so it's the storage, the sharing, the editing, the deleting, the um, manipulating, the analyzing, um, and so on. Um, and it's important to understand that wide definition because um, certainly things like what the, the include storage is, is very important. And um, I'll explain why a bit later on. But it's really important to understand that processing is not just the bit that you've collected the data for and, and the, the, the processing you're going to be doing for that purpose at, at a, a much wider definition. And there are three key players um, when it comes to um, data protection. You have the data subject, who's the, the individual whose data it is that's being processed. Um, the data controller, who is the organization that's collected the data from the data subject and will determine how it's going to be processed. And then you may have a third party who is acting as a data processor, who is doing the processing based on instructions from the data controller. So in a, a very simplistic um, email marketing model, you will collect um, uh, data subject email addresses. So those email addresses belong to the data subjects. You've collected them, which makes you the data controller, um, but you pass them to a, a third party marketing company to do your email marketing for you. So they're processing the actual list and they would therefore be the data processor. So those are the, the key definitions. As I say, there's, there's many more in the, in the regulation, but those are the sort of the, um, the uh, underpinning basic ones that it's always worth um, just recapping on. Now, in terms of data protection principles, uh, if you're familiar with the Data Protection Act in the UK, <coughs> oh, excuse me, um, you'll know that there's eight data protection principles, which are the six in blue there and the two in orange. Um, and um, the GDPR has all of those, although it only refers to the top six, um, the blue ones, um, as principles. The individual's rights and international transfer are still in the GDPR. They're just not referred to as principles. Um, and the GDPR actually introduces a seventh, which is called accountability. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But basically, these are the rules by which you must process data. So processing must be lawful, fair and transparent, for example. Uh, I'll talk about what lawfulness means in a, in a second. Um, but uh, fair and transparent is about being open and clear as to why you're collecting the data and what you're going to be doing with it. You must only process the data for the purpose for which you collected it. Um, if you um, need to use it for something else, then you've got to be clear that you're using it for that something else. And you need to be sure that it's lawful for you to be doing that. The data you're collecting and you're going to be processing has to be relevant. So if there's pieces of data that you're collecting, but you don't really need them, um, so if you don't need to know date of birth or you don't need a postal address because you're just dealing um, um, uh, with them in, in a digital sense, then um, you don't need to collect that, that kind of data and you, and you shouldn't. You must also keep um, all the data you have up to date and accurate. There's kind of two sides to this. One is that if you get told that the data has changed, then you need to make sure you update your records. And if you share the data with any third parties, then you need to make sure that their records are updated as well. And the other side of it is that um, when it is uh, a, a, an opportunity for you to do so, then you should verify that the data is still um, accurate and, and relevant as well. You must also only retain data for as long as you have the lawful reason for pro processing it. Um, if you're um, just keeping data forever, then you're in breach of the regulations um, and where well, have been for the last 20 years um, because you should only keep the data that you it is lawful for you to keep. Um, and if you don't need it anymore, then you should delete it. And finally, um, all processing must be done securely. So remembering what I said about the wider definition of processing, the storage, the, the sharing, the editing, and, um, and so on, always has to be done in a secure way so that the data is not accessible to people who are not supposed to be seeing it. And as I said, the individual's rights and international transfers, if you're familiar with Data Protection Act 1998, they're in there as principles, but they're not referred to as principles within GDPR. They're, they're um, particular um, sections or articles in, in, the, in the regulation. Individual's rights are the rights the data subject can expect about the use and, and uh, about um, the access to what data is being processed about them. Um, the probably the most well known one is the subject access request, which gives the is the individual right to um, say what data do you have on me 
I want a copy of it and what you do what do you do with it there's a whole range of um, there's about eight of them um, and I'll talk about some of the ones that are new and also um, uh, some changes that are coming for the subject access request one in, um, in a bit when I get to start talking about GDPR but there's a, a list of different rights that, that range from that subject access request to the, the right to object to automated um, decision making and, and processing um, and various other things. And then another important one um, is international transfer and that's, that basically uh, the rules say you mustn't transfer or process data outside the EU um, unless it's being done so in a country that has adequate data protection. There is a list of countries that have adequate data protection laws. Um, it's not a very long list um, and there aren't many uh, countries therefore on that list. Um, it's maintained by the EU and um, if the country you're having your data processed or transferred to is not in on that list, you've then got to look at what are the other options. So um, the, the obvious uh, countries to consider are, are, are things like India for, for people who are outsourcing to call centers and um, the US. So in the US, there's an agreement between the EU and the US um, governments about um, the data protection principles and, and data protection and it's called the Privacy Shield. It used to be called Safe Harbor. Um, that got poo-pooed um, by um, a court in Europe and, um, and now they've got a new system called the Privacy Shield. Um, and you would therefore require that the organization in the US has signed up to the Privacy Shield if you're going to be processing data outside, uh, sorry, in, in the US. Um, for countries like India and, and, and other countries who don't have adequate data protection, they don't have a Privacy Shield equivalent. Um, the question then becomes, well, how do you meet those adequacy requirements? And there's um, standard contractual clauses that are available from our regulator, the Information Commissioner's Office, and from Europe that are approved ways of um, enforcing in a contractual sense and a legal sense um, that organization agreeing that they will be processing data in, in line with European standards. And then the grid green bar at the bottom, that's ultimately what GDPR is all about, is about accountability. And I, I, I'll, um, I'll say what that, that means in, in, in a bit, but that's essentially the seventh um, data protection principle from, from GDPR. So when it comes to what's lawful processing, well, there's a number of different ways um, or, or bases that by which look, processing may be lawful. And it's important that you, um, when you're processing data, that you um, meet at least one of these. The, the obvious one, the one that lots of people are talking about because of the changes, um, is consent. So this is where the data subject said, yes, here's my data. I consent for you to be processing it in the way that you've, um, you've said. It isn't just because it's at the top of the list, that doesn't mean it's always the one that you'd go to by default. You, there may be other more appropriate ones to uh, rely on. And, um, and also, if you look at the next one, which is required for the performance of a contract, that's about if you collect data because you need it to be able to deliver a service or perform um, a, um, a contract that somebody you've entered into with the, with the data subject, then that's your lawful basis for processing. You don't then need to ask for consent to use their data um, um, for uh, that part of for part of that service. So, for example, if you're dispatching products, you don't need to say, "Well, I need your postal address to be able to dispatch you the product." Can you give me consent to then use it for, for doing that? You, you don't need to do that. The dispatching of the product is part of the service, therefore, it would fall under that requirement of a performance of a contract. You may also be obliged by law or a regulator or, or some form of uh, uh, legal obligation that says that you must process data in a particular way, maybe keep it longer than you, you have a reason to, to do so. Um, common examples are uh, taxman expects us to keep data in the UK for um, up to seven years. So that would be if you didn't need that data for seven years, the lawful basis would be that you're keeping it purely for, the, for answering the taxman should they come and audit. Um, HR law in the UK says that you should keep employee records for up to six years after an employer has left, um, sorry, employee has left, um, just in case, um, because uh, six years is the uh, period by which they can take you to tribunal if they chose to, to do so. So you would need to be able to defend yourself and therefore it would be lawful for you to keep the employee data for the purposes of defending yourself should they decide to take you to a tribunal within six years. So that would be the, the, the uh, lawful basis for processing assuming you didn't need that data for any other lawful reason. 
Um, the bar in blue, uh, protecting interest of the data subject, that's, that's, that's a kind of a, a life or death scenario. So if, um, if somebody believes that the subject is at harm or there's a risk um, to the subject, then it may be lawful for them to process the data for the purposes of, of protecting the, the interests of the data subject. So um, say, for example, a, a doctor feels a bit concerned about some of the things he's hearing from a patient, so it would be lawful for him to share or, or her for, to share the data to a, um, a third party uh, medical pr practitioner for the purposes of uh, protecting the, the, uh, the, the, the health of the data subject. Public bodies can also process data if they believe it's in the public interest. So if there's a scenario where they've got data that would um, protect a, a general population or, or um, something that is of interest, uh, would be of interest to the, to the public in general, then that may be their lawful basis for processing. But unless you're a public body, you're unlikely to be able to uh, make use of the um, lawful basis for processing being in the public interest. And then finally, we have legitimate interest, a, a, a bit of a um, a bit of a grey area, mainly because it's a tricky one to to um, call upon, um, because there's three elements that you need to basically um, confirm before you can claim you have um, a legitimate interest. So you can only use a legitimate interest if there are no other ways that you could um, process the data lawfully. So if there is an opportunity for you to get consent for the processing, then you must go for consent. You can't say you've got a legitimate interest. You must also make sure that it is absolutely necessary for you to be processing data in that particular way. And finally, you also need to be sure that um, there is no uh, detriment to the uh, rights and protections of the data subject from that processing. So. It's not about having uh, control and power over the data, um, which is uh, would then lead to um, harm for the data subject from the, the processing. So um, it's not an easy one to be able to uh, necessarily get your head round. There, there is a data protection network um, paper, um, which um, I think has been approved by the Information Commissioner's Office as well, that sets out legitimate interests and also um, the kind of circumstances where you might use it. But also there's a, a legitimate interest assessment um, process that they've um, introduced, which is probably a good way of looking at whether what you want to do with the data fits within that um, legitimate interest scheme. Um, the kind of thing where you could claim legitimate interest, well, the um, uh, sort of the obvious thing is if a, 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 a customer or the data subject is not paying their bill, you have a legitimate interest in passing that data to a third party for the purposes of chasing a, a, a debt, for example, and that would be your legitimate interest. Um, you certainly wouldn't be able to go and ask for consent, for example, because um, they're unlikely to consent to it if they're not paying their bill in the first place. Um, and then one of the one of my favorite ironies about data protection is that it would be a legitimate interest for you to keep a list of all the people who have unsubscribed to your email list purely for the basis of knowing that they've unsubscribed and to protect you from accidentally adding them or, or emailing them um, in, in future. So again, you could claim from a um, use of legitimate interest in direct marketing that um, it's a legitimate interest for you to keep that data and as long as you're only using it for that purpose then um, that it would be lawful for you to do that and, and claim that as a legitimate interest. So that's the lawfulness of, of processing. So let's talk about the general data protection regulation and, and what that actually means uh, going forward. So this fan diagram here on screen um, represents the, the 10 key things that are um, or areas that are changing with in GDPR and not all of them will be relevant in, in all scenarios, but um, I'll work my way through those and give you an idea of um, some of the things to, to consider. So let's start with scope. Um, the important thing to know about GDPR, if, you, if you're not already aware, is, is that the R stands for regulation and in European law, you either have directives or you have regulations and directives are implemented by member state law independently. So each member state interprets the directive and implements it within their national law um, themselves. That's what happened with the Data Protection Directive of 1995. In the UK, it became the 1998 Data Protection Act. The problem with directives is that um, because they're implemented and interpreted by member states in different ways, um, different member states implement certain things in different ways. So a German person might understand their rights and freedoms in, in, with their data in Germany, but it might be processed or managed slightly differently if, they, um, if their data has been processed in France or in the UK, for example. And, and I pick Germany for a reason, because German data um, and privacy rules are, are typically much stricter than, than most of the other European countries, including the UK. 
But because this is a regulation, this applies across the whole of Europe, which means that it basically is a blanket coverage replacing all equivalent member state law. So it's replacing the UK's Data Protection Act 1998. Um, and regardless of the fact that UK are, um, are going to be leaving Europe, it still applies. It's coming in this year. We're probably not going to leave Europe or not start to leave Europe until next year. Um, and also, we have a data protection bill being discussed in Parliament at the moment, which is going to probably become a Data Protection Act 2018, which basically says GDPR is UK data protection law. Um, they don't really need to do that, but they're doing it because they want all laws to be in place um, uh, for, for Brexit purposes, um, for, work for when we leave. And also, it's important that we are doing our most to uh, demonstrate that we have adequate data protection, because once we're outside of Europe, we'll be a non-European country and if we're processing European data we'll need to be sure that um, we can demonstrate that we have adequate data protection controls in place. So it's a blanket coverage of, of data protection um, and therefore applies across all European member states but it also impacts um, businesses operating outside the EU who are targeting EU customers so um, or EU citizens so if you're uh, say a US business and you're um, uh, you've got a website in Italian because you're targeting Italians, then GDPR applies to you and it will be difficult for you to demonstrate that you weren't targeting Italians if, for example, the website was in Italian um, and uh, therefore GDPR applies and in certain circumstances you might need to have a person um, who is domiciled within Europe to represent you from a, a data protection um, perspective as, as well. Um, and also, um, just for clarity, the GDPR um, makes it clear that online identifiers should also be con included in the definition of personal data. So if you have an IP address and you can use that data to understand that it's a particular user and you know who that user is, then that IP address is also personal data, as would be a Twitter handle, as would be any other um, online identifier that you might be collecting or, or processing. So that's a, 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 some, some of the changes coming with um, in terms of the scope. Um, and, and also, just, just to be clear, well, in terms of when the regulation comes in, it will become uh, regulation on the 25th of May 2018. So we're, we're about three months away um, until uh, it comes into force. Um, it is actually a law now. Um, it came in, uh, into law across Europe in 2016. Um, and we are now currently in the grace period. So if anybody talks to you about um, the fact that there'll be a grace period on the 25th of May, and that we need to be given a bit of time to get ourselves ready. I'm afraid the, 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 the bad news is that we're already in that grace period. We're already supposed to be getting ourselves ready. So um, we had two years to do that. Um, 25th of May 2018 was when it becomes uh, law across the whole of Europe. So accountability, I mentioned this as the seventh GDPR data protection principle. This is about it being up to the controller and the processor to demonstrate their compliance. So they need some way to be able to show that they are being compliant and they've taken heed of the, the regulation and what it means to their, their businesses. Um, and in some instances, certain businesses, um, so ones that process large quantities of data or are large themselves, so like 250 plus employees, will have responsibility to um, record their processing activities anyway. But as a general best practice, if you need to be able to demonstrate that you are compliant, it's probably worthwhile that you have documented doc, uh, processes and um, procedures and that you have um, discussions around data protection, which are documented so that you've got some evidence to demonstrate um, that you are compliant. So that's more of a best practice thing rather than a um, necessary you're required by law to do it. But accountability comes uh, is, is, you know, is a fundamental part of GDPR and comes across the various different aspects um, and so uh, yeah it's an important part and if, if, if there's any advice to, to be given at a basic level I'd say document everything that you have from your decision makings be that discussions at the board level and documented in board minutes or specific um, uh, papers or, or documentation because you need to if it comes to the crunch you're going to have to demonstrate that you've considered all the all the ramifications and in your opinion you're doing the right thing and that could be a um, that could uh, you know save you from a fine or may even mitigate such a, a high fine. It's, there's, there's no guarantee of that, but um, it's going part of the way to uh, to uh, to help show that you've taken this all very seriously. So that's accountability. Um, if you offer information society services, which is European speak for um, online services, 
um, aimed at children or children are likely to use them and uh, consent is the lawful basis for the processing of the data so you need the children's data and you need to ask for the consent you're going to have to also make sure you get um, guardian consent as well so you'll need to consider whether you need age verification software to be able to work out how you can determine whether somebody really is a child or not um, and if they are how you can um, get the consent from the um, from the, the child's uh, guardian, par parent, carer, etc. Um, you also need to make sure that all the messaging, um, as is required for consent in general, um, is is clear enough to understand for a, so for a child to understand exactly what it is that um, you're asking consent for. So it has to be child friendly messaging. You need guardian consent, and that might mean you need to consider age verification. Um, tools to uh, to be verifying that you are indeed de de dealing with a child. And in terms of consent in general, the rules, everybody's talking about this, so um, um, I suspect you've probably heard about it. The consent rules are changing. Um, you have to be very clear and open about what it is that you're asking somebody to give you consent for. You then need to allow them to actually give you take a positive affirmative action to give you that consent. So that's a positive opt in. So you can't use pre ticked boxes. You can't use odd wording to so for somebody to, to be unsure whether they're supposed to be ticking or unticking a box. You can't use phrases like we'll assume you're OK until you tell us otherwise. It has to be a positive opt in. So they need to understand exactly what it is that you're asking them um, to consent to. And they're saying, yes, I, I do consent to this. And here's my uh, you know, tick in the box or I'm pushing this button to say, yes, please go ahead and process my data in this way. You also need to record the consent. So this is accountability again. You need to be able to demonstrate that the um, consent was given and the means by which it was given um, and the, 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 the date and time that um, it was given as well. So in a, uh, in a, in a sort of a simplistic MailChimp email marketing um, scenario, um, actually MailChimp with its double opt-in, which may or may not be turned on by default, it should be turned on for de by default if MailChimp believes you're in Europe, um, it gives you that rubber stamp of consent. So um, they filled out um, a form um, and given your email address and then that email address, uh, that email, they re then receive an email which says, to, you know, are you sure you want to, um, to join this mailing list? They say yes and they get added to the list. MailChimp records when they were added to the list. The double opt-in thing isn't a legal requirement, but it, it sort of rubber stamps that consent process, and then you've got the, the recording of the consent as well. So there are tools out there, and obviously MailChimp's just one of a number of different email platforms that can help in that in that regard. But you will need to be clear how you um, show and demonstrate that you've collected a positive opt-in and that you've recorded how that happened. So you'll need to be able to manage your list and say, well, actually, people on this list have come through this sign on mechanism or this consent mechanism on this particular web page or this particular process um, and uh, they they became a member on this particular um, date and as i said tools like mailchimp can help you with that you also um can't force consent on somebody so that's consent without detriment so that's basically saying well we'll, we'll let you do so and so but um you're consenting to say our marketing or you're consenting to this if uh, um, regardless of what you what you think um so you can't force consent upon anybody and everybody has a, a absolute right to withdraw their consent at any time and, and really to by any by any means um so this is why you need unsubscribe links at the bottom of emails and um your marketing emails and um, um the ability to uh, deal with anybody say ringing up and saying that they don't want to receive your marketing or that they've changed their mind about the, the processing of the data that they consented to in the first place so clear messaging positive opt-in Record there was consent was given. Don't force somebody to give you consent, and make sure that you can handle people withdrawing their consent. Now, in terms of individuals' rights, there's uh, three new ones and and one that's changing. Um, the right to be informed. This is covered by Articles 13 and 14. This is the right that an individual has to understand exactly what you're doing with their data, how. Um, how you're um, why you're collecting it how you're going to be processing it how long you're going to keep it how they're going to how they can complain to you if they want to how they can complain to the regulator and so on article 13 is is the bit that lists the majority of the stuff that needs to be um listed <coughs> oh excuse me um 
and um, is the kind of stuff that you're going to be putting in your privacy policies and maybe your terms and conditions, depending on the, the point at which you're communicating um, and meeting that requirement to, to inform the, the data subject. Article 14 is about when you get data given to you by a third party and you're going to be processing it, it tells you you've got to do everything that Article 13 said, but you've also got to explain within a month that you've got that person's data and, and how you're going to be using it and, and where it came from in the first place, so how you came, came to be um, processing it. So that's a right to be informed. Subject access request is an existing right, um, but it's changing. Um, you used to be able to charge, certainly under Data Protection Act 1998, you could charge £10 plus VAT um, for carrying out a subject, uh, processing a subject access request. And um, you had 40 days to uh, comply with the request. Under GDPR, you've got to do it for free um, and you've uh, got less time. So you've only got um, a month in which to comply. If you are in an organization that receives lots of subject access requests, then this, this could be a, a serious concern because um, there, is, uh, some, there was some research done towards the end of last year that implied that I think it was over 70% of consumers now knowing that they can subject access requests for free um, would be doing that from um, the end of May um, to see exactly what their organizations uh, that they've got, who've got their data are doing with that data. So if you're in a utility company, the finance industry, insurance, uh, um, telecoms, uh, or any industry that people are a bit suspicious about what you might be doing with their data, then you might see a, a sharp increase, maybe as a, a spike, perhaps, rather than long term, of subject accesses um, because of the lack of the fee. Because um, I, I know from uh, personal experience that uh, Sometimes the ten pounds plus VAT was enough of a barrier to stop people um, wanting to go ahead. So, uh, if you were, are relying on that barrier to um, sort of keep the numbers down, because people don't, and, uh, you know, they sort of say, "Well, actually, if it's going to cost me a tenner, I'm not going to going to pay that. I'm, I'm not that bothered." Then um, I'm afraid that's gone, and you you don't have that barrier anymore. And plus, you've got uh, less time to do it. And uh, if you don't keep up with them, you will get yourself publicly. Um, told off um, by the Information Commissioner, um, because um, that's what happened to the Ministry of Justice, um, I th think last month, um, because they are behind with dealing with their subject access requests and they've been told to sort it out or, or, or else. The, the right to erasure is an, a new um, individual right. This is a right that says that um, uh, subjects can say they don't want you to store their data anymore. Um, it isn't an absolute right, so this isn't a right to um, where there's another lawful reason for you to be keeping or there is a lawful reason for you to be processing the data. So, for example, um, it isn't a, a right for somebody to say erase my billing information so that you can't charge me. Um, it isn't a right for somebody to say um, delete my data, you don't need this anymore um, when you need it for a, uh, a legal purpose. So, um, you know, the, the tax records, this isn't a, an excuse for you to not keep your tax records. Um, and so on. So it's not an absolute right and there's specific conditions under which um, it applies. Again, it's difficult to know, but there it could, you could speculate that people may misunderstand what that right to be forgotten or the right to erasure actually means for them. And, uh, and that could uh, lead to a, a, an increase in people saying, well, just delete my data and they may, may be misunderstanding what they can expect to happen in that case. And whilst you may not be doing anything that is, is unlawful and in breach of the regulation, you're having to put time and resource to dealing with um, your clients perhaps that are, are questioning whether you're absolutely right that you can keep the data longer when they thought that you had the, um, they had the right to, to delete it. So there, there may be an expectations issue that you might have to handle in, in uh, dealing with um, requests to erase data. And then finally, there's the, the right to data portability. So this is a, a right that says if you, um, uh, the, uh, an individual can say um, they would like their data exported in machine readable format so it can be imported over into a, a, a new system. And um, the, the law actually says that if you are able to facilitate the transfer as well, then you should do so. So if you have API connections into different across different platforms for competitors and those kind of things, then um, that's one of the things that could be expected of you um, in terms of uh, meeting this, this requirement to provide a machine readable export of a, a, a customer's or a data subject's data. Um, it, it, it is limited to the data that's provided by the data subject, but um, it also can include things that are sort of referred to as observations. So in the utilities world, for example, um, you might want to transfer from one 
um, power provider to an uh, electricity provider to another. And therefore, you can log into your, your portal and say, I'm switching to another provider. And, and you can expect that to transfer. But as well as your customer information that you've provided, um, you could expect your meter readings to be transferred as, as, as well or, or to be exported into a machine readable format. For, for most systems, we're probably talking about CSVs, but the regulation does apply uh, sorry, does um, allow for different uh, platforms and industries to have their own standards in, in data as long as they work in between um, the different systems. So that's the right to data portability. Um, and just, just a, a, an extra thing to say to that, in terms of subject access and in terms of um, erasing data and in terms of producing a, a machine readable export of the data for the data portability, you of course need to make sure that the person who's asking for those things to happen um, are, is actually the data subject in the first place and um, you mustn't uh, disclose any third party data and, and various other things need to be considered as well. So you will need to have a process for, for understanding whether that person really is who they say they are. Now, if you're a, a data controller and you're using a, a, a third party processor, then there is a change in the way that the controller processor relationship is working. Plus there are extra processor responsibilities that didn't exist before. So Article 28 of the GDPR sets out that if you're a controller using a processor, you must make sure that the processor is GDPR compliant because you shouldn't be using them if they can't guarantee your own GDPR compliance. Which means that if you're a controller, you will need to be um, checking to see whether your processors are actually GDPR compliant. Um, and Article 28.3 sets out a list of contractual terms that need to be in place between the controller and the processor. And they range from obvious things like you will only process my data in a way that, <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, so yes, yeah, so those contractual terms range from everything from, um, uh, you will only process my data in the way that I've asked you to, right through to actually giving the controller the ability to go and audit the GDPR compliance of the processor if they feel they need to. So you will need to look at how that factors in between you as a controller and you or, or you as a processor in terms of whether you're um, talking uh, about um, updating legal contracts or terms and conditions and so on. Um, and also, if you are a data processor, then you need to consider the fact that um, now you could be held responsible for a, a, an issue um, under existing uh, UK law, the Data Protection Act, the, the buck almost pretty much stops with the data controller, even if it was a data processor that caused the problem. But under GDPR, if because the controller has done all its due diligence and has all the documentation because it meets the accountability principle and so on, can demonstrate as it was the processor that was at fault, then it could be the processor getting the fine or the investigation and, um, and uh, could therefore be held responsible. So if you're a data processor, then you've now got responsibilities and liabilities that you wouldn't have had um, in the past. And I just want to say, remember what I said about the wider definition of processing. So that includes storage. And therefore, if you're using a uh, online cloud based service for the processing of your data, maybe a CRM like HubSpot or Zoho or Salesforce, or you're storing data in the cloud. So you're using a Dropbox or OneDrive or you're using MailChimp for your email marketing. You're storing data in a third party system, which makes you the controller because it's your data. But that third party system, that cloud based service would then be the data processor. So you'll need to consider that um, um, when you are thinking about um, what you're doing with your data and how it's being processed, because that processor um, description, uh, sorry, the processing definition goes much wider than just the use. Remember, it does include storage. So if you're using third party services um, for the um, storage of your data, you're using third party processors. So that's a very important thing to, to uh, to consider and, and to be honest, um, there aren't many businesses out there who aren't using those kind of um, cloud based services um, to help uh, run their business and therefore um, as this is an important part for them. Um, in the UK, we've had privacy by design and privacy impact assessments as, as a best practice for, for some time, but it's now part of the regulation. So it will become law that you have to consider data protection by design and default, which is a concept that says, if you're going to be doing something new with the processing of data, 
um, and uh, maybe you're implementing a new processing system or a, a new uh, database or, or um, some other um, product or service that has an impact on the processing of data, then you must consider data protection at the beginning of that process, not as an afterthought. And you can use tools like the data protection impact assessment to assess that you meet those requirements of, of the regulation um, in terms of uh, implementing that um, uh, within, the, within the, the, the service or the product or whatever it is that you're doing. But DP, uh, DPIAs, data protection impact assessments, can um, are, are required by the regulation when there is high risk processing of, um, of, of data um, and that's high risk to the data subject from that, that processing and there's some guidance from the Article 29 Working Party, which is the European regulators, um, about what conditions might require you to say you are doing high risk processing and, and it's worth having a look at that because you need to determine whether you do fit the criteria by which you might be processing data that is considered high risk for the subjects and um, if you do you'll need to carry out DPIAs um, probably before the 25th of May on your existing processing um, and you will also need to be sure that you uh, whether you need to have them in in the future um, for any new ways of processing data or, or handling um, um, the data that you might have um, particularly if as I say there's a high risk to the, the, the subjects. Unfortunately the, the guidance does give you some guidance but it's, it's, it's a bit woolly in some areas so um, um, but I, I certainly have a look at um, that if you're if you're uh, uh, particularly processing lots of data or determining um, outcomes which could have an impact on the data subject or that you're processing things like special categories of data which are health records, biometrics, uh, trade union membership, um, political beliefs, religious beliefs, sexual orientation of that kind of um, sensitive data then um, it's definitely worth you looking at that guidance and looking what the regulation says about whether you need to carry out a data protection impact assessment. Now, data protection officers um, could be mandated by law. They don't apply to everybody, but the law says that if you um, meet certain requirements, you will have to have, by law, a data protection officer who will need to be registered with the Information Commissioner or the regulator in your country to ensure that you meet the data protection standards set out in the GDPR. Um, public bodies, for example, um, do require to have a data protection officer. There's no, 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 uh, no choice on that. Um, but if your core activity as a, a, um, an organization is the regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale, you too will also need to have a, a data protection officer. The, the only problem is core activity, regular systematic monitoring, large scale aren't defined in the in the regulation, um, but there is some guidance that sets out some examples and scenarios as to how to interpret whether you fit in within those criteria. But you do need to consider what that might mean um, for, for you, because uh, if you are mandated by the data protection officer, the regulation sets out what the expectations are for your organization for what that DPO should be doing. And essentially, the, the regulations there to say not to allow if you need to have a data protection officer not to um, require uh, not to, to um, the, for the organization not to tell the data protection officer to go and sit quietly in a corner and stop going on about data protection because it's a, a bit of a nuisance is to allow the data protection officer to play a pivotal role within the organization to ensure data protection compliance and if you need DPIAs a, a DPO will be uh, so data protection impact assessment, a data protection officer will need to be involved in, in that as it would be in terms of projects relating to uh, considering data protection by design and default and so on. So you might need to have a look at that um, guidance and what the regulation says to determine whether you need a data protection officer within your business. Um, and if you do, you need to abide by the rules as to what that data protection officer is allowed to do and you'll need to make sure that they, you've registered them with the regulator so that the regulator has a, a contact point um, for your data protection officer. Some regulated uh, um, uh, bodies, uh, sorry, regulated industries already have um, breach reporting requirements, but the regulation, the GDPR, implements that for um, uh, pretty much everybody. Um, if there is a, a breach in uh, data that is uh, uh, um, a significant breach, then it may be needs to be reported to the regulatory body, which would be the Information Commissioner in the UK. 
Um, and uh, if it's a high risk to the data subjects, you need to tell the data subjects as well. So not only are you telling the regulator that something horrible has happened, um, which might then spur them on to do some investigating, um, you're also having to tell your customers that their data is being breached and that they, they need to do something about um, making sure that they mitigate any risk to themselves. The um, thing to uh, be considering is that breaching um, of data is, is not just your typical cybersecurity incident where your, your database gets hacked and stolen. Um, the unlawful viewing of data, the uh, accidental editing or deleting of data is also considered a breach. So breach has quite a wide um, wider definition than you might think. Um, but you do need to look at that and, and understand whether you may have to report the breach to the information commissioner and uh, the data subjects. Um, and if you choose not to, because you don't think you need to, then you need to be able to demonstrate that you have a register of breaches um, that documents um, what breaches you've had and why you chose not to report them um, and so on. So that's all part of accountability again. And finally, um, a lot of people talk about fines as part of um, uh, what GDPR is all about. So the Information Commission says it's not what it's all about, but um, The thing with fines is there's a number of different levels of fine within the um, regulation. The, the top level fine is up to 4% of global turnover or 20 million euro, which is ever the largest. However, as I said, the Information Commission has been very clear in the UK that this isn't all about um, fines. It's about proportionality and considering on a case by case basis. So I very much doubt we'll see such large fines. Um, and you can see that in the kind of things that they're looking at and how they're dealing with um, uh, issues right now under Data Protection Act law, um, where they can fine up to a, a maximum of half a million. Um, if you consider the car phone warehouse uh, breach from 2015, which was reported on a couple of uh, weeks ago, um, they got fined 400k, which is um, not the full whack. And uh, was it was a significant breach. It had millions of uh, customer and um, employee records stolen through a, a lack of security on their on their website. Um, but that was the, I think, the the, the uh, joint highest um, fine that the Information Commission has ever given out. If you then compare that to something completely um, the other end of the spectrum, um, there was an NHS trust that shared patient data with Google's DeepMind AI project with a view that if AI can help with better patient outcomes, surely that's of interest to the patients. Um, they had lawyers, they wrote documents, they considered it all, they considered whether it was lawful for them to share the data with Google for the purposes of um, this AI um, uh, process and concluded that it was in the interests of the subjects and they would therefore not need to get consent. However, the Information Commissioner found out about it and said that they got it all horribly wrong. Um, they've got steps put in place to ensure that um, they get it right going forward. Um, and uh, the key thing is that nobody got fined. So when you consider it was an NHS trust sharing data with a global corporation, i.e. Google, and it was special categories of data because it was health data, you would have thought somebody somewhere would have got fined. But I think that's evidence that um, if you can demonstrate your, um, you've considered all the checks and balances, you've carried out impact assessments, you've documented your thought processes and how you reach the conclusions to the way you're processing data, that meets the accountability principle, but also could be the difference between you getting a fine and not getting a fine or getting a, a smaller fine than, than a rather hefty one. So. The important thing, and the Information Commission has blogged about this, is that GDPR isn't all about fines and, and not to focus on that. It's about making sure that you're accountable for your data protection and making sure that you're, you're compliant. Um, and the other thing to also point out is there are actually other remedies available. So data subjects can, if they wish, sue you for damages. And um, if they believe that you've uh, the breach or whatever it was, the issue of the processing of their data has caused them some kind of harm. Um, and employees can go to prison and company directors who are complicit in a, in a breach or um, in, an, in an issue, if it can be proven to be the case, they could go to prison as well. So it's not just about fines, but that's what people tend to be leading with these days because it's all about scaring people into doing something because that 4% of global turnover or 20 million euros is, is, is a significant um, um, issue for, for any size business. But as I said, the point is that um, I don't think it's as bad as uh, it all sounds. So that was GDPR. Um, 
in terms of um, the main changes. Um, I'm going to move now on to um, um, GDPR and privacy and how that um, comes into play, particularly when we're dealing with electronic marketing, because um, that's that's very important. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm, I'm mindful that I'm, 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 uh, we're sort of running out of time. Um, so in the UK, marketing compliance is a mixture of data protection and therefore will be GDPR and privacy regulations which are implemented in the UK as the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations, or PECA, P-E-C-R. Um, these privacy rules are probably well known for the cookie um, uh, things that we need to put on our websites and cookie notices and, and cookie policies, um, but they also set out a set of rules on how email marketing, text marketing, phone marketing, and if you still do it, fax marketing um, can, can work in a lawful way, and they work together with data protection. And essentially, the rules vary depending on whether you're dealing with prospects, whether you're dealing with customers, whether you're dealing with businesses. So if you're dealing with consumers and you don't have a business relationship with them, so they're cold leads or they're prospects, you will need to be sure that you have consent for the purposes of marketing. The GDPR therefore needs to apply and therefore the GDPR consent rules apply. So if you don't have a business relationship with them, they're cold prospects, you need, need to have collected consent in a GDPR compliant way. However, if they're customers and you've got a business relationship with them, provided you've given them the opportunity to opt out of your marketing, you won't necessarily need to go and seek consent, but at the, as part of the customer journey or the sales process, you need to be clear you wish to be marketing to them and they need to be able to give you the um, tell you yes they do or no they don't so um, the rules are slightly different in that scenario I think as best practice I would go down the route of um, getting opt-in rather than trying to um, get people to opt out so I think you'll be in a much better place if you uh, are able to demonstrate that you've um, not forced it upon somebody but have said look we would like to market to you there's lots of opportunities of um, uh, we can sell you other things that are going to be useful to, to you um, and uh, if you tick this box, we'll, we'll add you to our marketing list. I think that's a, probably a better way of doing it. So think GDPR consent regardless, but the law strictly sort of talks about cold leads, you need consent. Customers, they need to be given the opportunity to um, say they didn't want marketing. Now, if you're dealing with business, so if you're, if you're business to business, if you're doing electronic marketing, Provided they're not sole traders who are treated as consumers. So if you're dealing with sole traders or individual partners within the business, then um, consumer data is they need to be treated as consumers. So the Information Commissioner says that um, sole traders are like consumers. So for, for marketing purposes and therefore um, you should treat them just as I've just said about customer, um, consumer data. But in a in a strictly B2B, so that's limited PLCs, uh, limited liability partnerships, etc. Um, you don't need consent. So you can collect emails um, for, for people through your business cards, through LinkedIn and through uh, Google searches and, and so on. You don't need consent. Um, and if it's generic data, you definitely don't need consent because it won't be personal data anyway. So if you know the managing director's name and his email address, it's his personal data, but you wouldn't need to seek consent from him for marketing. But in all of these scenarios, whether it's consumer data or business data, whether you're dealing with sole traders or B2B, um, marketing, you must um, provide the facility for an opt-out because everyone has that absolute right to withdraw their um, withdraw the from from the marketing and unsubscribe from your email list or or to say to stop to the SMS marketing. So, uh, from a consent point of view and where that fits into GDPR, particularly if you're dealing with business to business marketing. That is uh, probably better news than you, you may have heard um, because you wouldn't need consent in the B2B marketing, um, but certainly for consumers, you, you, you will. So let's move on to some challenges. If you, if you look at marketing, um, there's a number of, uh, if, you're, um, if your consent is your lawful basis for processing, which it will be if you're dealing with consumers um, who you don't have a business relationship with, then you've got to consider about how do you deal with consent for new data, third party data, the data you've got already, and, and what do you do about maintaining consent going forward. So in terms of consent for new data, it's about understanding what your uh, data capture points are, what they say, making sure they meet the new GDPR consent rules, 
and adjust them accordingly. Make sure your privacy notices are GDPR compliant, meet the requirements of the right to be informed, Article 13, for example. Um, and you need to, uh, I I've pretty much say all the time, and I've been saying it a lot, to meet the accountability principle, record your approach and findings, because that's the bit that will document um, why you're doing stuff in the way that you are and, and could help you if you were to be investigated. If you're dealing with third party data, so that's a, a, a say an email marketing um, list that you've bought in, you can still do that, but you're going to have to carry out due diligence on the third party provider to make sure that they are um, GDPR compliant and the data was collected in a GDPR compliant way and it was clear it's going to be shared with organizations like yourself. And if they if you've commissioned somebody to do it for you, then they should be listing you as the um, end user of that data and somebody has to be clearly um, given the consent on the basis they understand that. And if they won't provide you with appropriate consent and proof, uh, sorry, appropriate consent, uh, appropriate proof of consent, then um, you shouldn't be using that data because you, you can't be sure that these people are authorized to uh, 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 share that data with you. And again, therefore, record your approach and findings to, to, to show that you've uh, considered all the, all the ramifications of the processing. In terms of the data you've got right now, the, the law doesn't say that you need to repurpose um, all of your marketing lists and uh, where, where consent is required, but it does say that if your consent mechanisms didn't meet GDPR standards, then you will need to repurpose um, GDPR um, uh, consent, um, and therefore you will need to work out how you can lawfully seek and re-verify consent with your existing contacts. So if you've been collecting email addresses using pre-tick boxes or other marketing data where you need consent um, in a non-GDPR compliant way, you will need to look at how do you um, seek consent and be sure that you can do that through the means by which you want to do so. So for example, um, if you don't email people seeking consent um, on a regular basis and they would be surprised to hear from you you can't email seeking consent because that in itself is marketing so you're gonna have to look at how you how you do that um, but so think about it as an opportunity to refresh your data if you can segment your data down into people who really interact with you then work out work out how you're going to focus on on getting them to continue with their consent but you need to make sure that you've got gdpr consent going forward and um, to continue to use um, this data that you're going to be um, processing um, uh, for, for marketing purposes. And again, document everything so that you can demonstrate that you've thought it through thoroughly. And uh, the bad news is consent isn't for life. Um, th there is some guidance that's in draft format from the Information Commissioner that implies that you will need to regularly requalify consent. That is probably going to be something you'll need to do on, a, on, on uh, every couple of years. Um, and you need to be sure that you are making it easy for people to withdraw consent, that you act on that withdrawal consent, you don't try and hinder people from, from doing it. Um, and therefore you need to make sure that your marketing team understands exactly what they can and can't do when it comes to this mixture of GDPR and privacy rules. When it comes to the controller processor relationship, the key thing is work out whether you're a controller or a processor because there's going to be work that you're going to have to do. And if you, you may be in some circumstances a, a, a bit of both and you need to, um, to consider what that means for you. So if you're a controller, make sure you're only using processes that are GDPR compliant. If you're using some of the household names like Google, Salesforce, HubSpot, um, MailChimp, et cetera, just Google their name and GDPR and see what comes up and you, you should, you'll get a, a flavor for where, the, where they're at. Unfortunately, I think as with all businesses at the moment, they're not quite there with their GDPR compliance right now. So they're not being very upfront and clear as to what they'll what they're doing to be GDPR compliant. So whilst you're going through this process of determining whether it's all right to carry on using them, they're not being very clear as to whether it is OK to carry on using them. They're, but they're typically saying that they will be uh, compliant by the 25th of May. So you've got to find a, um, a point at which you you keep on top of that to ensure that you're clear that they will be GDPR compliant by the 25th of May. But you will need to carry out due diligence on all your third party processes. Remember what I said about processing being everything that you do with that data, including storage. So you will need to carry out third party, uh, sorry, due diligence on your uh, cloud based storage for third parties like Dropbox, like OneDrive and, and so on. Um, and make sure these contractual requirements are in Article 28.3 are in place as well. Now, you know, for some of these big, big cloud based providers, you're going to be you're not going to be able to get your lawyers to write to their lawyers and enforce a new set of contractual terms. They're going to tell you to um, 
um, look at their terms and service. So have a look at their terms and service and their conditions, expect them to be updated to reflect these um, uh, these, these contractual requirements, but more from their side rather, rather than yours. And um, the other thing to also bear in mind is you need to pay attention if they're not hosting the data in the EU um, about the adequacy stuff that we spoke about earlier. So you might need to uh, make sure that they're signed up if they're US based to um, the uh, Privacy Shield um, or also consider um, whether there's an option in the in the software or, or the settings that enable you to determine where your data is stored. So, for example, if you're running, um, uh, if you're uh, using Microsoft Office 365, I believe that there's some settings in there that you can, can tweak to say that you want your data stored in Dublin rather than uh, in the US. If you're on the other side um, and you're the processor, you can therefore expect your class customers and clients to be asking you to um, provide them with uh, evidence that they are GDP, you are GDPR compliant, so they'll carry out due diligence on you, which is uh, probably a, a good thing for you to have there for a, a GDPR statement, um, um, a, 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 an exclamation of what you're going to be doing if you're not there yet, and uh, or what you what you've done to uh, assure them that they are um, okay to use your services because you are GDPR compliant. Expect them to be pushing on these, uh, pushing onto you these stricter contractual terms. Which, depending on your your relationships with with your clients in that regard, that may be that you you tell them that you've implemented them through terms of services, or you can expect addendums to existing contracts, perhaps from from your clients. And be mindful that you have these new responsibilities that you didn't have before. So when it comes to being GDPR compliant, what does that actually um, mean? Well, there's a number of different ways of looking at it. I've summarized it in, in six uh, points there, and I'll, I'll talk about the second one, auditing, in a, a moment. But if you can, appoint somebody to act as a champion for data protection within your business and take single uh, responsibility for it. It doesn't need to be a full-time employee. It doesn't even need to be the main part of their job. But do look at whether you could have somebody who keeps on top of data protection compliance and acts as that single point of contact because even if you're uh, if you're mandated to have a data protection officer clearly that's the person that you're going to be using in that in that regard but if you don't need a data protection officer it's probably a good idea to have somebody who is um, the the central focus for data compliance and um, because that will enable you to keep on top of any changes and make sure that the the business understands that they can go and talk to this guy and and make sure he or she um, can give them the advice that they might want as i said audit your data systems and policies and talk about what that might mean in a moment um, document everything have data protection policies in place consider looking at what kind of policies you might might need you might need a general data protection policy you might need how to deal with subject access requests how to deal with breaches and and so on provide as much information to help your staff understand what data um, protection is all about and what it means to your business and how they can find out more information so if you've got intranets or, or wiki pages that you use within your business then have a data protection section as well definitely train your staff if your staff can understand why data protection is important and that their role in that, that data protection compliance across your business, then that will help your business as a whole be, be compliant. And in fact, if the information commissioner was to come and audit you, they want to say, well, where's your policies and where have you been, you know, where's evidence of your training? So don't forget to train your staff, because if you can train your staff to understand you've got these policies in place, who they can talk to if they've got questions, where they can look for more information and why it's important that they pay attention to it not only for the business but also for their own um, responsibilities then you're instilling a culture across your business to understand um, why data protection is, is important and, and that's a very important thing and then finally I've mentioned it a few times um, um, already make sure you maintain your compliance and keep everything up to date there's a lot of things that could change particularly over the next couple of years and you need to be sure that you're on top on top of that and I'll mention it again in a second, but when it comes to carrying out an audit, there's, there's essentially five stages I see it. You prepare your business for the fact that you need to go ahead and do it. That might be getting senior, uh, senior buy-in from uh, your managing director or, or from the board. You might need to set up a working group or a working party of people across the business, somebody from sales, from IT, from customer services, from support, from HR, from um, uh, uh, 
the compliance team if you have one and, and so on so that everybody can work together to deliver that that compliance but you need to look at auditing your data systems and policies so you understand exactly what you've got right now and then analyze that about where you uh, against where you need to be with with gdpr compliance which will then inform a, a delivery plan which sets out exactly what it is that you need to do to achieve by the 25th of May. And if you're looking at this and thinking that's a lot of things we've got to think about, then obviously you need to get on and do this quite quickly because, um, as I say, the 25th of May is only about just over three months away. Make sure you deliver training to your employees, maybe even bespoke training to particular pe people. So your marketing team might need to have specific marketing compliance training um, and salespeople might need to understand a, a different set of, of rules. But generally, across the business, make sure everybody understands what data protection is all about. And then again, manage your ongoing compliance, keep everything up, up to date, make sure that you're on top of any changes in laws or regulations and that everything else is, um, is still relevant. So when it comes to auditing, why not have a personal data register and, and, and start with recording what it is uh, you've got, what data you have, what's the lawful basis for processing, why you've got it, how long you're keeping it and where it's stored. And where it's stored ties in with a processor register, which it gives you an idea of what processors you're using and all the systems. So bearing in mind what we were saying about um, third party cloud based services, whether you need to carry out due diligence on them, um, what their retention policies are, how you can meet the requirement not to keep data any longer than you need to, how you meet the requirement for um, right to be forgotten and how you meet the requirement for the portability stuff through those systems. So if you're using a third party customer management system, um, how how do you export the data that you need to meet the right to data portability, for, for for example? And then finally, have a policy register. So document the policies, who's responsible for them within your business, um, where data protection is uh, is relevant, so that you can be sure that you've got a, a good record of what you need to look at and probably change um, going forward. So. Um, the other thing, as I said, is managing ongoing compliance. That is about making sure your policies are up to date, make sure you refresh your training and you have training in place for new starters, making sure that you're up to date with what's going on um, in, the, in the realms of um, data protection, ensuring your security is still adequate and making sure that you can deal with user rights. So um, the key message is that GDPR is not like something like the Y2K where it will happen on the 25th of May and on the 26th of May we'll wonder what all the fuss was. Data protection is here past the 25th of May. It's not just about the 25th of May. Yes, you've got to be compliant by the 25th of May, but compliance will go on for the next 20 years or until they introduce a new data protection um, regime. And one of the things that you will need to do is keep on top of all the things that are changing. And um, there's a lot that could change. I've talked about the data protection bill in the UK that will become an act probably um, in the next couple of months. Um, that has the possibility of introducing even stricter stuff than what the GDPR says that that, that, that could be allowed in, in UK law. The privacy regulation. So when I was talking about when you do and don't need consent in marketing, that could all change because there is uh, a new e-privacy regulation being discussed in Europe, um, which was supposed to be coming into play on the 25th of May this year at the same time as GDPR, but is unlikely to happen. But when that does come in, there is a possibility that all those things I was saying about digital marketing could change. And digital marketing is probably going to be expanded to include other channels as well as the, the typical email and text um, and phone. But also... If the regulation says you need consent for B2B marketing, then everything I said earlier is all, and will change and you'll need to make sure that you, you keep up to date with all that kind of thing. So, um, and, and likewise, if it's left to the member states to determine what the rules should be, the UK government might implement stricter rules. So this is another area where you're going to have to pay attention if you're doing uh, electronic marketing. Um, there's a lot of guidance coming out. Um, it could have been done with being com um, coming out much sooner, but it's still being rolled out right now. There is consent guidance, but it's still in draft form. Um, we're waiting for that to be finalised. Um, there's Information Commissioner in the UK. They have guidance and they have workbooks and things which will probably be updated um, in terms of um, the kind of uh, best practices in certain things. So there's a whole section on health and uh, records and, and employee, how to do with employee and data protection issues. That kind of thing, those are all going to be updated, but new stuff will be coming out about interpreting GDPR and also the European regulators, they all get together as the Article 29 Working Party and produce guidance as well. So you need to pay attention to that. 
in the UK, we're Brexiting. That might have ramifications if we're seen as being a, a third country like the US are. Um, depending on how the Europe feel about whether we've got adequate data protection in place, obviously the government will do its best to make sure it can facilitate that adequacy. But um, you need to pay attention to what that could mean, particularly if you've got European clients sharing European data and we've left Europe. Um, suddenly that um, lawfulness of international transfer is something that needs to be considered. And of course, enforcement, there'll be case precedents set where people are um, regulators, maybe in different countries in Europe are determining different outcomes in, in interpretation of the regulations that could have ramifications on how we do things um, here in the UK or in, in another member state. And whilst that all sounds really negative, um, very small sales pitch, um, I'm mindful of um, the, the time. Um, there is, of course, um, some answers and solutions and I provide services. So if it all sounds a bit overwhelming, then um, I've got a digital compliance hub, which is an online service that helps businesses with their data protection, privacy and marketing and web and data compliance. Um, is part information service um, providing help and tools and part helpline. So uh, you get uh, um, a limited access to uh, phone support, but also um, unlimited email um, support. So if you've got a question and you want the reassurances, you've got somebody you can um, fall back on for, for help and guidance, then Digital Compliance Hub um, might be for you. Um, but I also sell um, audit, um, sorry, consultancy services. So I'm working with businesses carrying out GDPR audits. Um, I run data protection officer um, services. So if you need an outsourced data protection officer, then um, have a chat with me and um, we can talk about what I, how I can help in that regard. Um, and I do by the hour, by the day consultancy and advice services as well as well as offering training. So um, whilst that last bit was a bit rushed and there's a lot of sort of negative things about um, things you're going to have to do and also pay attention going forward. Um, there's lots of services out there that uh, can help you. So apologies that last few bits were were a bit rushed. Um, it was taking I was going through it a bit more slower than I, I was anticipating. And um, uh, so I need to speed up towards the end. But um, hopefully that was very helpful. Now's the opportunity to ask some questions. So there's a questions uh, section in the control panel you can use. Um, and um, by all means, uh, ping some questions over. So I've not got any at the moment, but um, we've got 15 minutes to, to answer any questions. So uh, please uh, type away. Okay, well, there's nothing coming through. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, there, <laughs> there was. Um, oh, thank, thanks, Joseph. Um, some feedback there. Um, I think it was very helpful. Thank you for that. That's really, really kind. Any questions from anybody? If, if not, um, Oh, here we go. Here's some questions. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, Kate's asking, what size of organization needs a data protection officer? So it's not necessarily about the size of the organization. It's more to do with the kind of processing. If you're a public body, you've got no choice. You must have a data protection officer. Um, but typically um, it comes down to the, the bit I said earlier. Um, saying that if your core activity is is the processing of data and that processing is systematic and regular monitoring of data subjects. So maybe you're, you're, you're monitoring employee behavior or you're monitoring behaviors using data and determining outcomes, and that you do that on a large scale, then you will need a DPO. The problem is those three things, core activity, regular systematic monitoring, and um, D, uh, high, large scale don't, uh, I'm sorry, aren't defined in the GDPR. The regulation gives some examples, but I'm yet to work with a business where I can say, actually, yes, you're that example there, and, and therefore we know you do or you don't need one. And um, so there is an element of interpretation of both the regulation and even the guidance. Um, but um, for example, I, I've um, spoken to e commerce platforms saying, well, we sell stuff online, but we don't sell at the scale of Amazon. So does that mean we're not large scale and don't need to worry about these, this uh, requirement? But it would actually come down to demographics. And um, so if, uh, you know, then the next question is, well, are you selling a niche product? Yes, we're, um, you know, we're, we sell niche products and we're 80 percent of that market. Well, then that probably makes you large scale. So I'm, I'm afraid, Kate, it's, it's not a, 
a, a, a very black and white answer because the, the, whilst the law seems quite black and white, there's different ways of, of looking at it. What I would say is have a look at the Article 29 Working Party guidance um, and have a look at what the law says in, in, the, in the regulation uh, um, and uh, see if that helps. If you go to the Information Commissioner's Office website, so that's ico.org.uk, you can actually see various elements of the GDPR broken down into sections and it will give you the link throughs to the various pieces of guidance. But um, it's, it's, not a, um, it's not necessarily a size thing, it's more about what kind of processing you're doing and whether you're doing it uh, on a large scale. Okay, so uh, Yorka Bell's asking a question. If I want to get consent from clients, could I not send that in a separate email with no marketing or extra sales pitch, pitches just for the purpose of getting consent? So you have to be really careful here um, because um, there was a case in the UK with um, Honda. They, they collected a load of email addresses that people had given for sending out um, uh, brochures for cars from showrooms. And, and they then emailed those people, or Honda emailed those people and said, we would like to add you to our marketing list, but we need you to consent to that. And people complained because that wasn't why they'd given over the email address in the first place. And the information commissioner agreed and said, well, just asking for consent in that in that scenario is marketing. And therefore, they got fined and they got fined 70K. So you've got to be really careful. There are ways that you can um, get around it in terms of um, using alternative things. But of course, if you've only got an email address, you can't use postal marketing. Um, so you'll need to be very careful. I, I would say think about it very carefully. Document your thought processes. But in, in essence, if it's um, if you've been maintaining communications on a regular basis, but you need to repurpose consent and you've been doing that through um, you've been marketing through email and people have had plenty of opportunity to opt out, then I say it's probably reasonable for you to carry on sending your marketing messages and therefore include a consent um, uh, message as well. But you need to make sure that that consent message is GDPR compliant. So don't say things like unless you reply to this email. We'll, we'll keep you on the list. You'll need to say, you know, click on this link to go to our website to sign up to our new list, which is the, the new marketing one and, and things like that. So you've got to be really careful about that. And, and that Honda case is a good example of, of why you've got to be sure that you're not marketing to people who didn't expect to get marketing in the first place. Uh, thank you for your comments, M um, Melina. Um, okay, so, um, right, I've got loads of questions coming through. Right, so where where are we? Right, so Linda says um, she's a member of a club and we regularly send out newsletters of which we have asked members to subscribe. We will need to send out consent forms or have we effectively gained consent already? So the the concept of members and newsletters is, is, is an interesting one and a, and a tricky one. I'd say if somebody's joined up to become a member, provided you've made it clear that you part of that membership is a is a newsletter and that those people can opt out or those members can choose not to receive the newsletter then you can carry on and you wouldn't need to seek consent because you could argue that being a member of a club is is like being a customer of an um, of a of a company and therefore you have that business relationship with them um although probably not in a in a business true business sense um, but I'd say if 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 uh, a condition or not a condition, if a part of the membership includes receiving a newsletter, make sure people have the opportunity to say they don't want the newsletter. But you can probably carry on. And again, just as I said before, if you if you are continuing to um, send out newsletters and people have the opportunity to opt out of them, then you're probably going to be OK anyway. Uh, good question from Jennifer. Sorry, they're all good questions, but <laughs> Jennifer's asking a, 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 a really good one. Um, where can you find examples of privacy notices that are GDPR compliant? So I wouldn't say it was necessarily GDPR compliant right now, but in terms of the detail and the amount of information you probably want to um, need to include, I would say have a look at the Information Commissioner's um, privacy policy, because that is very detailed and can be an excellent way of, of judging the kind of detail and the kind of areas you need to consider and if you look at it you'll see it's not just about visitors to the website it's about what happens if you apply for a job what happens if you fill out a form and, and so on so um yeah I'd, I'd use the information commissioner's um privacy policy as a, a as a starting point um to help um sort of inform what kind of things you need to consider 
Um, the only thing I would say is I think last time I looked, it was still referring to the Data Protection Act. So that's why I sort of said maybe it's not GDPR compliant, but it will give you um, a flavour of where it needs to be. And obviously, one would expect the Information Commissioner to um, have um, an adequate privacy notices, uh, notice in place. And if they can't get it right, then um, there's no hope for the rest of us, I don't think. So, yeah, check, check out the Information Commissioner. Uh, so Anita's just asking clarity around uh, consent for B2B. So provided the business is not a sole trader, because that has to be treated as though they're a consumer, um, you can market to people within a business without needing consent unless they have opted out of your marketing. So if they've told you to stop, then you must stop and you mustn't include them in any future marketing. But you don't need consent to be able to um, to contact people within a business. Um, you just need to make sure it's relevant to their role, um, but then why would you be marketing stuff that's not relevant um, to, to them in the first place? Okay, so Tristan, I've just answered your question um, in answer to Jennifer's about privacy policies. Um, Right, so another good question. Um, Tripti's asking about whether you need to re-permission re consent um, for direct marketing contacts where the only bit you've not got is a, is, a, 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 is recorded the opt-ins. Um, I, I, I would say that you probably need to be careful. The, the, the law says that GDPR consent is clear and transparent messaging, positive opt-ins, and um, clarity about when that consent was given. So in, 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 a, in a, I guess, in a black and white law purpose, then, then yes, you're going to need to consider that where con if consent is required, that you will need to repurpose that, that consent and how you would do that for the purposes of recording it. But I'd say have a look through what you're doing um, within your um, organization and seeing whether there is some way of understanding where this, this has come from. But if, if, if consent is definitely required, and you can't do that and you can't be sure that people have or haven't um, pre -tick bo um, had to untick pre-tick boxes or whether you've been adding stuff manually to a mailing list or whatever. Um, I, I would say if you're in if you're in the boat of not being clear, you're probably going to need to reseek consent, to be honest. Um, so Melina's asking um, what the role of a lawyer could be in, in, involved in regarding GDPR. Well, um, they provide services like I do in terms of helping businesses meet their compliance needs. Um, lawyers can help with the contractual side of things. Um, so I think there's, um, I, I know that there's some, um, certainly local to me, there's some lawyers who specialize in, in data compliance and, and uh, digital businesses who are looking at how they work with their clients, mainly on a contractual basis. Um, I, I guess it's sort of, um, you know, swings and roundabouts, whether you use a consultant, whether you use a lawyer, um, the differentiator might be the cost, it might be the kind of services they're offering. Um, there, there will be data lawyers and privacy lawyers who will specialise in this particular area and will give you um, a very lawyer um, view of, um, of GDPR. Um, but there's also consultants like myself who can help with, um, with it on a, a, maybe on a more practical le uh, level rather than a contractual one, if that, if that helps. Okay, so going back to Tripti's question, um, he just um, the, the, sorry, they've just verified that um, they're B two B. So same thing as I said before, if they're B two B, as long as they're not sole traders, um, then um, you wouldn't need to get consent anyway. So you probably don't need to do anything in that regard. Um, Kate's asked a, a good question about um, responsibility of organisations registering with the regulator. So. Um, there is going to be a new registration scheme. The GDPR doesn't talk about registering with your um, regulator, but in the UK, we have a Digital um, Economy Act, which does say that the uh, government have the right to uh, Im implement the Information Commissioner's Office and have a registration scheme, and, and we're waiting to see what that might look like. We're expecting it to be more expensive um, to be registered, and but. Um, I mean, contrary to popular belief, the Information Commissioner regulator is not funded by the fines that it serves. It's f funded by the, the registration. So that's why there will still be a registration scheme and it will be the, um, the data controller or the processors that will need to define what they're doing in the, in, in, or registering how they, they um, process data. So 
it, it's going to be the controller or the um, the processor. So yes, the organisation will be the one that will be required to uh, register with the regulator. So um, Michelle, Michelle's asking, if you're a data controller because you've got employees or you manage marketing data, but you're also a data processor because you're um, managing data on behalf of clients, how does that work? Well, it means you're a data controller for your um, your employee and marketing data, but you're a data processor for your for your clients' data, and you need to consider that you're a bit of both in different circumstances. So when we were talking about understanding what you should do in terms of your employee data, for example, if you outsource payroll, then you need to make sure your payroll provider is GDPR compliant so that you can be sure that you're, you can continue to share your employees' payroll data with your, um, your payroll provider. Um, so you'll be carrying out due diligence on them. Um, if you're processing data on behalf of your clients, you can expect your clients to be carrying out due diligence on you as the processor of their data, and you would need to demonstrate to them that you're GDPR compliant. In terms of the GDPR compliance piece, I think if you get yourself to a point of being GDPR compliant, then you're unlikely not to be able to demonstrate your GDPR compliant for your for your for your clients. Um, but there, there's kind of two different sides to, to that story, and you'll need to be a bit of both, I'm afraid. Okay, so I'm going to pick out a few more questions. Um, We've got quite a few, and we're just running out of time. I, I'm happy to carry on past uh, ten o'clock, and the and the the webinar shouldn't shut down when we come to to ten o'clock. So I'll, I'll just pick out a few, um, but I'm, I'll have to call it a day because um, we're run, run, running out of time, and um, and I've got loads of questions there. So, um, So somebody, um, so Yorker Bell saying that a uh, GDPR seminar they attended, um, the speaker said that um, you should avoid consent as a legal basis unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and it is generally everyone's first port of call. I, I, I'd agree with that. I, I think the, the mysticisms around consent and what that actually means um, because of the changes has sort of brought consent into most people's minds as the way that you go forward and you should always ask for consent and it was a point i made earlier consent isn't by default the lawful basis for processing there may be other reasons why you're processing the data and if they meet those reasons you won't need to get consent so you shouldn't by default go for consent you should look at what is the lawful basis for my processing I need this data to be able to deliver the service. That's your lawful basis for processing. You don't need to get consent to be able to process it to deliver that service, for example. Um, so yeah, I, I'd um, I'd agree that yes, you should look at what the lawful basis for processing is. And from those forms I, I sort of quickly flashed up on screen, um, you'll see that um, you know the kind of things that you need to think about is what is your lawful basis for processing, and definitely don't always rely on uh, consent being the um, the uh, the way forward because it may not be necessary and you shouldn't ask for consent if it isn't necessary. So um, Jennifer's saying, um, how does it affect emailing customers um, or clients? For example, if if they require information from from them for accounting purposes, such as an explanation regarding a certain bank transaction, can we still that? Yeah, yes, of course, you you can still process the people's email addresses for the purposes of, of delivering a service to them. The, the way to think about it is, would the data subject be surprised to hear from, from you about the way that you're processing or find out how you're processing the data? And if they are, then, then you need to be really careful what, you, what you're doing because um, you should be surprising data subjects um, because they need to be well informed about how you might be using their data. But yes, if you're, if you're processing customer information, you've got a query and you need to ask them something or you need to explain something to them, I would say that the lawful basis for processing is it's part of the service you're delivering and therefore it's, yeah, carry on doing that. I don't see that that's going to be affected um, uh, at all. Okay, so Daniel's asking about collecting data from uh, people in Tanzania and Malawi um, and what that means. Um, uh, with regards to the fact that they're UK based. So, uh, well, because Tanzania and Malawi aren't in the EU, the GDPR doesn't apply because GDPR only applies to EU citizens data. It's when you're 
if you were in Tanzania collecting data for um, uh, because you're providing services to Europeans from Tanzania or Malawi, that you would um, need to apply GDPR. So um, you, you will have to be sure that whatever um, the African laws are or Tanzania and Malawi laws specifically are about processing their citizens' data, that you comply with that. But GDPR won't apply for those citizens because they're not within the EU. Um, Kate's asking, can people, can you email people you're connected to on, on LinkedIn? Well, uh, you need to be careful about this, whether they're a sole trader or not. But typically speaking, if you're dealing with a B2B transaction that isn't involving a sole trader, yes, of course, you can con contact them. Um, but also the sort of ecosystem of LinkedIn is that you should be able to be able to interact with people and, and you know, generate business leads and opportunities. And I think that if you're on LinkedIn, you understand that that is what you're doing. So. Um, if you're talking about using LinkedIn's in mail, then I say that that can continue and you can still can connect to people without um, without having to get consent for them for them to do that. If you're scraping off their email addresses for the purposes of, of marketing to them, then I would say you need to be clear that they aren't sole traders because strictly speaking, they can um, uh, claim that you um, don't have permission because they never are used to ask for consent because cons um, sole traders are treated like consumers. But um, people in limited L uh, PLCs um, and uh, LLPs in, in UK terms, um, then then you don't need consent. You, there may be a brand a brand issue, so people don't like getting unsolicited emails, and even people in businesses, even though they're allowed, you're allowed to do it, might not like the fact that your your brand is associated with the fact that you um, reach out to people in an unsolicited way. So you might want to consider that, but that's not a, a GDPR aspect. Okay, it's five past ten um, so we've overrun a lot um, thank you very much for joining I'm going to stop the questions there what I'll try and do is I'll try and download a, um, a list of the questions that I've not answered and I'll follow up with those people um, um, afterwards via, via email um, just very very quickly um, uh, um, but thank you very much for all of your questions at the beginning I was wondering whether and um, we were going to finish early because there weren't any questions and all of a sudden there was a mad flurry of them so thank you very much for that as I said, I've been recording this, 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 um, the webinar, so I'll supply a link to the recording, I'll supply a link to the slides, and I'll also supply a link to those um, uh, data systems and policy um, register forms that I flashed up on the screen very briefly when I was talking about auditing in case they're of, of help as well. Um, um, but if you've not had your question answered, I'll, um, I'll try and uh, download those now and then um, uh, try and just ping you in a quick email to uh, give you the, those answers. So thank you very much. We'll leave it at that. Um, I'm going to stop the uh, recording now and I'll, I'll just stay online but um, um, to, to download the questions. Um, but thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.